Welcome back, lecture 47. Um, returned the other part of the test today, so I think we can kind of uh, address some things collectively about test three. Um, average score for this classroom was 84, which is very good. Lots of scores in the 90s, several scores, a handful of scores uh, above the 90s, so more than 100. I think 102 was the highest. And we had, I think, two or three of those. Uh, just some things that I noticed in common from grading the tests. Um, first two problems, um, I don't really remember anything in common. A few minor errors. Most of you got the first two problems completely right. Um, you do need to. I think I just wrote it in. I don't think you took any points off if you said, if you just kind of gave the equation. But it is either y of x equals that, if you have some y function in terms of x, or for the um, spring problem, it's actually an x of t. Uh, again, if you didn't have it x of t, I think I wrote that in, uh, changed your x's to t's or whatever. But do kind of pay attention to, if you're dealing with y double prime, y prime, and then functions of x, it is your final answer is a y of x. Um, I don't really remember anything specifically. A couple of minor errors on problem three. Uh, problem four, you did have to find the spring constant, which doesn't work out wonderfully, but it, it's not ridiculous because it is a, um, you can't factor it, but when you solve using the quadratic formula, you get um, alpha equals negative 5 and beta equals 4. And um, the C1 and C2 values, if you use those letters, C1 and C2, worked out to be pretty nice, too. I couldn't get integers as solutions for every part of every problem. Uh, I think problem three, solving for b, which is negative 16 fifths, and c, which is negative 69 20 fifths, those aren't delightful, but most of the problems had integer values. In five, so each of these, which I said uh, on the day of the test that each of these was worth 10 points, um, I really kind of intended for a to be kind of quick and easy. Um, look at it, 4 and 16 and 64, it looks like there's a common ratio. Uh, the ratio is negative 0.4. Several people put 0.4. Uh, if they alternate in sign, the ratio has to be negative. So it is an infinite geometric series. The ratio is negative 0.4. Uh, you should also in there at some point in time say that, so that I know that you know that the uh, absolute value of the ratio is less than 1, which combined with the fact that it's an infinite geometric series, those two facts make it converge. And it converges to 1, which is the first term, over 1 minus the ratio. So it's 1 over 1.4, which is equal to 5 sevenths. And then it's approximately equal to, well, I don't know, 0.714857, something like that. A uh, variety of reasons for number two. The simplest is that it's harmonic for, uh, sorry, part B. Uh, some of you chose to validate convergence on 5C separately from the decomposition, which is fine. So you basically compared it to a P, it is not itself a P series, but it can be compared to a P series. And then you decomposed it, looked at the telescoping pattern in figured that the sum all the way to infinity was 5 thirds. D was a gimme. The limit is 1 third. As long as the limit is not 0, you're finished. It diverges. Um, e, you were supposed to use the integral test. So that would probably be the highly suggested method, would be to go ahead and use the integral test, since that was recommended. Somebody used the integral test and another test, which is fine, because you did use the integral test. But 
you don't really need it in combination with any other test. And F, um, you can com compare it to either 1 over 3N or 1 over N, which is harmonic. Unfortunately, the comparison test doesn't quite get us what we want because it would need to be larger than the existing divergent series. This one, unfortunately, is smaller, but because it's very closely related to an existing divergent series, we can use the um, limit comparison test, which is F. And the bonus, although we've never done third order, uh, the pattern is the same. The tricky part about the bonus is there's not any real specific pattern that we have accumulated to this point in time for factoring a cubic polynomial. I could tell by um, some of your work on this problem that you used a graphing calculator, which is fine, to see what the roots were. Um, actually, with the coefficients the way they are, you can almost guess one of the roots. One of the roots is 1. You can just look at the coefficients and see that that would give you 0. Once you get one of the roots, you can use long division to reduce the cubic to a quadratic and either factor the remaining quadratic or uh, quadratic formula. But there are three roots. One's a double root, and the other is a single root. So you use that same pattern and go from there. So the solutions are on the solution sheet. If you want to kind of compare and contrast what you have, not that there's just one way to do the problem, um, but this is at least one correct way to do the problem. And if you think it's graded too harshly, then you can appeal the grading, but realize that that also opens up the possibility that more points could be taken off. I could say, oh, you know what? That, I forgot, I thought that was two points, and I took one off, and it's ten points. I should have taken eight off. Uh, I've never done that, but it is a possibility. But that was, uh, collectively, I thought that was excellent mastery of this material uh, across the board. 84 for a class average is excellent. All right, let's finish up 8.5 today. Let's see where we left off. We did look at some sequence of partial sums of the Bessel function. Why don't we start with that and a diagram that's from your book that I think has significant carryover. Um, as we finish this chapter, we'll be doing some things that are similar to this. Plus, I want to um, notationally, I have something from last class that's slightly different from this that's in the book. Um, I wrote the sequence of partial sums, so I wrote basically S sub 1 equals 1 because that was the sum of the first 1 terms. Um, in your book, that's denoted as S sub 0 because N starts at 0. Okay, So it's the same thing I was talking about last class. I don't know which one is better, to be honest with you, but from this diagram, let's go ahead and use the uh, notation that the authors have. So. This is the sum of the first one terms, even though they call it S sub 0 on the Bessel function. Here it is. That's not really very close. And you wouldn't expect it to be very close to the final curve because it's only one term. They call S sub 1. Yesterday we called S, or I mean Wednesday, we called S sub 2. Pick off the first two terms. Uh, 1 minus x squared over 4 should be a parabola that opens down, which is closer to the actual curve for a while, but then begins to deviate from the actual Bessel curve. We call this the sum of the first three terms. They call it S sub 2 because we're going up to n equals 2, n equals 0, n equals 1 equals 2. Those are the three terms, so you can see that it is, where is S sub 2? There it is. Comes up here. And that's kind of what a fourth degree polynomial should look like. It potentially could have 
four routes. I mean, if you slid that down, you could see four possible points of intersection with the x-axis, but it's not unlike any other fourth degree polynomial. You can see the coefficients, the uh, coefficient really, but it's the denominator term. So it's a 1 over 64, but you can see the denominator beginning to grow, which kind of connotes the fact that it's probably uh, convergent. In fact, this is convergent for all values of x. S sub 3, sixth degree, you really can't see enough of it here to show you what it's doing. But S sub 4, you can see it come down here and start to turn come down here and start to turn. Now, what does the whole thing look like if you had as many terms as you could possibly generate? That would be this graph here at the bottom. So the entire um, Bessel function, which is given to us by this strange power series, would look something like this. Now, the one thing that I think is valuable about showing this, it's kind of a oscillatory function. In a sense, it's more like a sine or a cosine with a variable yet decreasing amplitude. So here's the amplitude of the first branch. Here's the amplitude of the next one. Here's the amplitude of the next one. So it looks like this oscillatory function like a sine or cosine or sine plus cosine type function that has a decaying amplitude, but it clearly is not one of those. So it's, it's a function, and we don't necessarily have to use traditional um, oscillatory functions to end up with a function that does, in fact, oscillate. So that's where we left off um, yesterday, Wednesday, sorry. We determined that these were the three possibilities uh, when we dealt with a power series that it converges only at a certain value, namely the value that causes the binomial to disappear each time at x equals a, converges for all x, which is what the Bessel series did, and there's some interval of convergence, maybe including an endpoint or two or possibly excluding both endpoints. So we'll get a couple more examples of this category today. But we shouldn't expect anything else to happen. In fact, I think we've done all these examples, so I think this is appropriate. Geometric series, they are technically power series in X because the power of this one grows by consecutive integers as we allow n to scroll from 0 to infinity. Uh, the interval of convergence this is this series. So we can see that the ratio is x, and it converges if the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1. Well, that means in this case that the absolute value of x is less than 1. There's the interval of convergence. Uh, we did this example. It was um, convergent for only a single value, and that single value that caused this one to converge was 0. That was our A value in this problem. You want to write it in there, it looks kind of ridiculous to write it as x minus 0, but it is x minus a, and a is 0, and it converges at that a value only. So if that's the interval of convergence, yes, it's not an interval because it's just the single value 0, then that means the radius of convergence is 0. Uh, let's go to the last one. The last one is the Bessel function. We decided it converges for all values of x. Therefore, the interval of convergence is negative infinity to positive infinity, and the radius of convergence is infinite. I think this is exactly the same example we did, x minus 3 to the n over n. 
we ended up with a, kind of a first answer of the interval from 2 to 4. We checked the endpoints. We decided it converged at 2 and diverged at 4. So we included 2 in the interval of convergence. Uh, we also decided this was centered at x equal 3, which that interval is, in fact, centered at x equals 3, 3 being the a value in that problem. And from that centering value of 3, basically we're going to swing an arc one unit left and one unit right, so the radius of convergence is 1, which kind of captures all the other values that cause this particular power series to be convergent. So they don't necessarily converge for all values. This, in fact, is kind of rare when they do converge for all values. This is a little more common for us to get an interval of convergence. This is in your book. Any questions about this, Nicole? Why is the third one down um, n is equal to 1? What's the difference? Zero. Uh, if we tried to start that one at zero, we'd be dividing by zero. So it's pointless. Right. Okay. So there really is no term for n equals zero. We can get the same power series. We just don't have a constant. Most of them will have a constant first when n is equal to zero. Um, in fact, all the others have a constant when n is equal to zero. This one, we can't start it at zero, so it does not have a constant. So the first term of that of this would be x minus 3 to the 1 all over 1. So that's the first term. No lead constant as a part of this power series. Anything else? Okay. Finish this up with these two problems. So these are examples. Both these examples we're going to do are in the book, but there's some interesting things that happen in them that I think it's good to see them happen in an example before we find them happening in another problem, and we haven't seen that in an example. Um, and I'd like for you to kind of direct me in how we go about determining if there is an interval of convergence if the endpoints are, in fact, included in the interval of convergence, what's the first thing we would do to determine convergence and divergence for this particular power series? Would it be easier to put n plus 1 to the 1 half power? Or uh, that might be helpful. I don't think that will be all that advantageous when we get to the kind of beyond the first step. What's the first step of these problems? the ratio test. So if this were a test question, I'm not going to say use the ratio test to determine the interval of convergence. So that's, that's the first step, is to use that. And I didn't mean that to be facetious, by the way. I'm, I'm just, you have to know that that's your first step, because I'm not going to say uh, to use that. And how does that go? Negative into the n. Okay, the n plus first term, and we do want absolute value, and it looks like this thing might alternate, right? Uh, I don't know if that would be all that. You, maybe we can do that on a second step. Uh, we could split that up, right? Negative 3 to the n equals what? Negative 1 to the n times three to the n. I don't know how helpful that's going to be, but that's if you wanted to separate the alternating part from a non-alternating part, because we are using absolute value, it's kind of up to you. So that n plus first term is going to be negative three to the n plus one. 
What else? X, 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 over squared uh, n plus 2. Good. Okay, get everything on the same line instead of having a fraction within a fraction. All right, so what can we do away with or simplify or somehow combine as we continue? Here's the n plus 1 on the bottom and the top and get a square root of 1. Uh, I wouldn't. But can't do that. I mean, we could do that, but we'd kind of like to get the right answer, so you better not. Negative you can't do that? Oh, no. Oh. No, you can't reduce parts of sums and differences that are under square roots and cube roots, or even for that matter, any kind of binomial. You can't just take a part of it and knock it down. Even though that was n plus 1 plus 1, so you couldn't separate n plus 1 plus 1 to n plus 1 and the square root of 1? You can, but you can't reduce them because you've got to have like terms. You've got to be able to multiply and or divide by something to reduce something. So if it's part of a sum or difference, you're kind of stuck with that. Now, we can deal with that. We can put them both under the same radical and get a simplified version of that, but that's not the way to simplify it. What about negative 3 to the n plus 1 over negative 3 to the n? Negative 3 to the 1. Negative 3 to the 1, and what about negative 3 if we've got absolute value? Just three? How about the X's? X to the one. Okay. X to the one in the numerator. And these ends, we don't have to worry about them being negative, so I'm going to move them outside of the absolute value and put them under the same radical. We really don't. In fact, we'll lose that uh, as we go to the next step because we've already, in a sense, taken the absolute value of it, right? And getting three. Uh, let's deal with this. Probably you know the answer. I mean, if n approaches infinity, what's 600 trillion plus 1 divided by 600 trillion plus 2? I mean, aren't they practically the same number, numerator and denominator? So if they're the same number, that's 1, and the square root of 1 would be 1. So we're probably going to get 1. Let's see off to the side if we can divide everything by n in the top. Divide everything by n. So n over n is 1. 1 over n, we know what happens to that as n approaches infinity. Don't both of these approach 0, right? As n gets infinitely large, so we've got 1 over 1, the square root of which is 1. So let's just go ahead and go to an answer. This circled part is 1. And we've got a 3x. We've already taken the absolute value. So we could leave it in there, or we could say 3 absolute value of x. Not going to make any difference. We're hoping that once we do the ratio test, that what we get for an answer, so this L, this limit, is what? In order for this to converge. We want the limit to be less than, one. less than 1. So here is L. 
So we want Sorry, I can drop the absolute value now, right? Should write that instead because we're dealing with the absolute value inequality. 3x can be less than 1 as long as it's greater than negative 1. Divide all the way through by 3. So at this point in time on this problem, this is our interval of convergence. Not a whole lot of values for which this particular power series converges. At least the interval isn't all that large. What would be next? Test the endpoints. Test the endpoints. Test the endpoints. So at x equals negative one third, I don't know if your mind operates this way, but my strange mind operates this way. As I'm writing it down, I'm trying to think what is their product going to amount to? And if it is what I think it is on my first go around, what if I have that number up there divided by the square root of n plus 1? Do we, have we dealt with anything that looks like that prior to this? So that way you have kind of an idea where to go. What do you think about the numerator? It's going to go to 0. It's like 1 to the n. 1, one? Yeah. right? One. No. Because we have something to the n and something else to the n, can we take their product to the n? Yeah. I think we can. So the numerator is 1? Yeah. What do you think then, if the numerator is 1? Not a harmonic because of the square root. Okay, so you want to use a comparison? Yeah. Okay, I think we've kind of done that generically. So we that would work. That would get you there. Can we use a P-series here? Isn't this very close to 1 over the square root of n? Not a whole lot of difference between n plus 1 and n when you're putting in infinitely large numbers. What do we know about this? This is really 1 over n to the 1 half. Right, so it's p-series. p is 1 half, and it diverge, or they diverge, when p is what? Less than or equal to 1? So you could say this is a p-series. What about this one? Well, although it's not really a straight by the letter P series, it's pretty darn close, so we could do what? We could compare. Is this one larger than this one, which already converges? Well, we're adding a little bit to the denominator, which makes it smaller, so that doesn't work. But then we could use the limit comparison test which you would have done anyway, so it's about the same amount of work. But as I was writing that down, I'm thinking square root of n plus 1, that's the square root of n, which is n to the 1 half, which is a p-series. So the limit comparison test would be, doesn't really matter the order, the 1 in question divided by the 1 that we know something about. You can work this out. It's basically a what we've already done, and that's going to be 1. Because the limit is some finite value, in this case, since this diverged, then they both diverge. So in other words, we don't want that endpoint. 
So that's not included. Let's check the other endpoint. Any questions on that before we move to the other endpoint? Any guesses what's going to happen at the other endpoint? Because it's going to be alternating. It's going to be alternating. Right. This one ended up being 1 to the n, which doesn't alternate at all. 1 to the n for differing n values is just 1 all the time. The other version has a high probability of being an alternating series. So the other endpoint is x equals 1 third. So what does the series look like? These are both to the n in the numerator. So their product is negative 1. So it is alternating. We could use the alternating series test. How does that go? Two pieces to it, two parts to it. It's got to be decreasing or ultimately decreasing. So the n plus first term, and we're not talking about the alternating part. We're talking about the numerical part. So the n plus first term would be that. Is that smaller than its predecessor? It is. Larger denominator, smaller fraction. And is the limit of that nth term description way out to the right? Is it 0? It is. So this is convergent by the alternating series test. So our final interval of convergence, we did not want negative one-third. We do want one-third. Centered at what? What's the center of that interval? Zero. And if you go back to the original problem, we didn't have an x minus a. We just had an x which is technically x minus 0. So it is centered at 0. And what's the radius of convergence? One third of a unit either way from 0, the centering value. All right, let's see if we can get through this next one a um, little bit quicker. We do have a value other than 0 that this should be centered around. All right, what are you going to write down first? Directions are find the interval of convergence, if in fact there is one. And if there is one, what's the radius of convergence? Ratio test. Ratio test. Everywhere there's an n, we now want an n plus 1. See if we can get everything all in the same fraction rather than have a fraction within a fraction. n plus 1, x plus 2, 
to the n plus 1. Be an n down here, x plus 2 to the n. We're going to have a 3 to the n plus 2 in the denominator. Multiplying by the reciprocal, we get a 3 to the n plus 1. All right, what leaves us? What stays around? And where is it if it's staying around? Okay, x plus 2 in the numerator. And that's going to stay in the absolute value symbols, right? Because we don't know if that's positive or negative. Three goes where? Denominator. Denominator. Can we bring that out front? <coughs> So a 3 in the denominator, right? We have one more 3 in the denominator than we do the numerator. And, then an and n plus 1 over n as n approaches infinity. One. This is just 1, isn't it? Does that work? We've got an x plus 2. We don't know if it's positive or negative. We better keep the absolute value notation. We've got a positive 3 in the denominator. We'll bring that out. The other n plus 1 over n approaches 1. So that'll be our answer. We want that to be what? Less than, Less than, than 1. We'll convert that to an algebraic inequality that kind of gets rid of or dispenses with the absolute value. Now what? Multiply through by three. Multiply through by three. <coughs> Subtract two. So negative 5 less than x less than 1. Now this is supposed to be centered at what value from the original problem? Negative 2. Negative 2. Is that centered at negative 2? It is centered at negative 2. Well, if, neg if we looked at this interval, negative 5 to 1 on a number line, which is what we have thus far, then our value, which we say it's centered at, actually should be in the center of this interval. How did you know that originally it was negative 2? Okay, somebody want to answer that question? How can you look at the original problem? It's x plus 2. The original problem, this was had an x plus 2, and generically that's supposed to be x minus a, in this case to the n. So what's the a value if x plus 2 is really x minus something? That'd be x minus negative 2. So there's our value about which it is centered. And what appears to be the radius of convergence? 3, right? Because we're 3 units in either direction. centered at x equals negative 2. Uh, the last thing to check, which we have just about enough time to do this, and then we'll be finished, are the endpoints. So our first endpoint is negative 5. For x, we replace it with negative 5. See what we get. So it looks like we have a negative 3. To the n.
Okay, what can we do with that to kind of get rid of some? Why don't we go ahead and call that negative 1 to the n times 3 to the n. That's the same thing as negative 3 to the n. That way we can knock out 3 to the n with 3 to the n plus 1, which leaves a 3 where? In the bottom? I'm not liking this one. It is alternating. I don't think it's going to pass the alternating series test, is it? Are the terms getting smaller as we progress? No, so the alternating series test is going to fail in the first part. So is n plus 1 over 3, is that less than n over 3? No. So it diverges. So we don't want that endpoint. The other endpoint was, what was it? One. I think it's in more trouble, isn't it? I mean, the other one had a chance because it was alternating. This one's not alternating. So there's 3 to the n, and we'll reduce it with 3 to the n plus 1, which leaves a any chance of that converging? How could we validate that? Right. There's the description of the nth term. In order for that to have a chance to converge, that's got to be disappearing to zero. Well, that's one third, which is clearly not zero. Therefore, it diverges. If the limit of the nth term does not go to zero, it diverges. So we don't want that point. We don't want that point. So the original um, interval of convergence was, in fact, our final answer, which was what? Negative 5 to 1. Is that all right? So that should finish us up, and we will forge ahead, but we will wait till a new week to do that. Have a great weekend.